Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining ACEEE's webinar today, CEIP and the Opportunity for Energy Efficiency. My name is Cassandra Cubes, and I will be presenting on today's webinar. And before we get started, first a few words on administration. All attendees are on mute. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the webinar, we ask that you please type them into your chat box, and we will get to them as soon as possible uh, as far as any administrative questions. But all uh, Q&A on the actual webinar content we're going to hold for the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar. Also, this webinar is being recorded. And just like all of the other webinars throughout this series, we will be sending out a link to all of those who have registered for the webinar. That will include a, a URL to view the recording of this and also a link to a PDF of the slides. So this is just a little bit on ACEEE's webinar series, of which this webinar that we're doing today is a part of. We introduced uh, this webinar series a few months ago uh, with the idea to explore the opportunity for energy efficiency to be used for clean power plant compliance. And each of the webinar has highlighted ACEEE's latest research and emphasizes best practices in efficiency program and policy design. And each of the webinars featured presentations from our program staff and our clean power plan team. And you can see the last uh, four webinars that we've, we've put on uh, the topics listed here. And if, you're, if you've missed any of those, you're interested in the slides or any of the content that we covered, uh, this is the link here to view the webinar recordings um, and also to get copies of the, the slide deck for each of these webinars for those that are interested. So today's webinar will be focused on the CEIP. And I should say this is the last webinar in this webinar series on energy efficiency in the Clean Power Plan. And we put out this webinar, uh, the topics for this, for people to choose. We call it people's choice. And it's kind of a resounding feedback that CEIP sh should be today's topic. And I think that probably coincided with the release of um, EPA's uh, latest proposal on the Clean Energy Incentive Program that came out uh, just about a month ago when we were conveniently putting out uh, the request to get feedback on what this topic should be. So hopefully all of you will find this as a timely and, and hopefully helpful webinar. Um, you can see myself listed here um, as far as today's webinar speakers, also Megan Kelly. Um, first a bit on what we're going to be talking about. Uh, again, I'm Cassandra Cubes. I'm a senior research analyst focusing on environmental policy here at ACEEE. And as part of our Clean Power Plan team, I conduct research, analysis, and outreach on opportunities for efficiency to reduce air pollution. And on today's webinar, I'm going to be focusing on key elements from EPA's latest proposal for the Clean Energy Incentive Program, or CEIP, as we'll be referring to it. Um, with an emphasis on the treatment of, of energy efficiency in this proposal, and also talk a bit about the opportunity to, to submit comments. And then we're going to be hearing from Megan Kelly, who is a senior research analyst for industry here at ACEEE. She conducts research uh, uh, and outreach on the impacts of state and federal energy efficiency programs and policies on energy use in the industrial sector. And today, Megan is going to be discussing the role of combined heat and power, or CHP, and the role that that can play and the benefits that it can provide to communities. So here is our agenda today. Uh, as I noted, we're going to be doing an overview of the CEIP program design elements, and then um, emphasize uh, a bit more how demand-side energy efficiency is, is treated in this proposal. Then we're going to hear from Megan on the opportunity for CHP in communities. And then we'll give you a, a preview of what ACEEE is working on for our comments uh, to EPA. And then we'll talk a bit about the, the comment submittal uh, details and the timeline. So here, I'm sure most of you are, are familiar um, with generally what the CEIP is trying to do. Um, it's a voluntary early action program. Uh, that seeks to provide benefit or early incentive for uh, the technologies listed here. So we're talking about demand-side energy efficiency and solar 
uh, implemented in low-income communities, and then also incentives for uh, additional renewable energy, including wind, solar again, geothermal, and hydropower. And we'll talk about um, what credit each of those types of technologies can receive and a, and a whole bunch of other uh, details that were put forth in this new proposal for those technologies. And a little bit on timeline, in October of last year, EPA uh, released the main elements of the CEIP Early Action Program, um, along with the final Clean Power Plan emission guidelines. And then there was a comment period surrounding those. So this new proposal, which was released last month, is and posted in the Federal Register, I believe, on June 20th. Um, this is responsive to those comments that EPA received uh, uh, over the course of um, the, the winter in 2015, and it also provides additional details for people to comment on. So this is not a final proposal, or a final program rather, uh, still in a proposed form. And some of the areas that, that um, we were particularly um, thinking would come through on this new proposal was the definition of low-income community, the size of the matching reserve for renewable energy and low-income efficiency, and a couple of other key areas. And we're going to be touching on those areas on uh, these next few slides. So here's a little bit about the um, uh, intended benefits of this early action program um, from the pers perspective of of EPA and, and what's noted in this new proposal. Um, this program can bring some, some benefits such as allowing states to get an early start on compliance, given that this, this program uh, is effective for the first two years before the start of compliance with the Clean Power Plan. And, and it allows states to do that by um, uh, providing incentives for investments in cost-effective and zero-emitting technologies. And with those investments, uh, additional benefits such as reduced utility bills, lower emissions, and uh, local economic uh, development can be realized for states and communities. So further, uh, it increases the incentive for energy efficiency in solar projects delivered to low-income communities. And it also incentivizes early investment in renewable energy. So now a little bit on the program specifics. We're going to kind of dive right into a lot of the details. So hopefully you both stay awake and uh, have some, some good questions on these things and things that we haven't touched on and hope that hopefully we can, we can answer at the end of the presentation. So again, this uh, early action program is for the years 2020 and 2021, the two years prior to the start of compliance in 2022. And uh, qualifying energy efficiency and renewable energy projects receive allowances or emission rate credits, ERCs, so that's allowances for a mass-based plan or ERCs for a rate-based plan from both the state as well as matching allowances or ERCs from EPA via the matching pool, uh, which is equivalent to 300 million short tons of carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions. And EPA included a conversion for ERCs to allowances in this recent proposal. One of the things that uh, we were thinking would be included in this, in, this, in this proposal from the prior one. And what this conversion says is that each megawatt hour of clean energy generation displaces approximately 0.8 tons of CO2 from carbon emitting generation. So that means 0.8 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour represents approximately the CO2 emission intensity of all affected sources in 2012. So a little bit more on the specifics here. Um, given that conversion that we just talked about, the one ERC is equal to 0.8 allowance, EPA is proposing to then define the matching pool in terms of allowances and ERCs as followed, as you see here. For mass-based trading plans, that means 300 million allowances. And for rate-based trading plans, given the conversion, that comes out to 375 million ERCs available in the matching pool. 
And EPA is proposing that this matching pool be split evenly between two reserves. 50% um, of the matching pool will be available for renewable energy projects through a reserve called the Renewable Energy Reserve, or RER, as we'll refer to it throughout the next few slides. And then the other 50% of the matching pool will be available for low-income community projects through the Low Income Community Reserve, or the LICR, as we'll be referring it to it as. And so overall, because of the conversion, that means 150 allowances, or 187.5 million ERC, are available in each reserve. And as you can see on the last bullet here, um, the EPA is proposing that no additional reapportionment uh, will occur between the two reserves in the, in the event that there are any unused matching allowances or ERCs by the end of this early action program. Instead, what they're proposing is that the unused matching allowances will be retired uh, by January 1, 2023. So uh, <clears throat> EPA is proposing also an approach to divide each of the uh, states and, and tribes um, prorate a share of the matching pool into reserve for renewable energy and low-income projects. And as you can see here, this is um, a selection of states, and it shows you the on the left-hand side um, the allowances uh, and how that comes out for each state, the 50-50 split. And then on the right-hand side is the ERC. So again, keeping in mind that conversion of allowances to ERCs, that's why the ERCs uh, have higher numbers, is because of that 0.8 to 1 conversion. Uh, and each state and tribe listed in this uh, document, and you can see the, the source here where you can look to for more information, um, each state and tribe with affected sources is given a proportional share of the 300 million short ton matching pool, and that's based on its required emission reduction from 2012 levels relative to those in other states or tribes. So that's kind of how EPA went about splitting this, this matching pot up between the states. So now we're going to get into project eligibility for this renewable energy reserve. Uh, we'll talk about that first and then get into the project eligibility for that low-income community reserve. So for renewable energy projects, EPA is proposing to include geothermal and hydropower in addition to the wind and solar uh, power as eligible for one -to -one, uh, a one-to-one -one award from this renewable energy reserve. And um, they're basing what, what constitutes an eligible renewable energy project based upon what they're calling commenced commercial operation. Um, and that in this proposal, that is defined as when a project begins selling usable electricity. Um, and that date is January 1, 2020, so the start of the CEIP program. And this is an example of uh, how a, a project would be awarded credit by both the state and the matching pool. You can see here in the event that a project, just for example, generates uh, one megawatt hour of clean energy, uh, the uh, project implementer would be receiving 0.5 ERCs from the state and then 0.5 ERCs from EPA's Renewable Energy Reserve matching pool that was allotted for the state. And that would then total come out to one ERC for every one megawatt hour generated under the project. Now we'll get into uh, this eligibility under the Low Income Community Reserve. So this is this uh, pot of, of matching credits or allowances is reserved for demand side energy efficiency and solar projects implemented in low income communities. And here the eligibility for demand side energy efficiency projects uh, is labeled under commence operation. So what we're talking about that is it's defined as the date on which an eligible CEIP low-income community project is delivering quantifiable and verifiable electricity savings. And that date is September 6, 2018. So whereas in the prior uh, CEIP draft there was some you know, consideration of 
you know, maybe it would coincide with whenever a, a state submitted their final plan to EPA. Now EPA is saying there's a date and that is September 6, 2018. And again, with the solar projects, they're to commence commercial operation on or after January 1, 2020. And here again is an example, and that is my bad, that should say projects are awarded two to one credit, not one to one credit. Uh, projects within this low income community reserve have a double credit. Um, so excuse me there, I'll, I'll fix that before these slides are posted um, for viewing later. But a project is awarded two to one credit. So that means that it gets one ERC from the state and one ERC from EPA's LICR matching pool. So that means for every two, it gets two ERCs for every one megawatt hour generated from clean energy or uh, an energy efficiency technology. So again, that's two to one, not one to one. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into the definition of low income communities. And this was something that there was a lot of comments that EPA received on this topic. Um, and they, they came out uh, in this proposal saying that states can choose their own definition of low income community. So it could be a local, a state, or a federal definition. The only catch is that the definition must have been established before October 23, 2015. That date is significant because that's when the final Clean Power Plan uh, emission guidelines were posted in the Federal Register. So, so long as a, a state has an existing definition that was established prior to that, they can, they can theoretically use it. Um, so what does that mean in practice? Well, states can then choose um, you know, one or more than one definition for their state plan, and they can take into consideration such as, um, you know, geographic or household-based definitions. They can have flexibility to address urban and rural areas. Um, they can take into account a definition that's used for existing utility programs, so there's a lot of flexibility there. A little bit more on the definitions. Um, EPA is also proposing uh, in, in this uh, new proposal released that um, they will be creating what they're calling presumptively approvable regulatory text for states. Um, and so similar to the model trading rules under the final clean power plan, it's kind of like a, a guideline uh, for a model for states to follow for their state plan. This presumptively approvable text will be something similar to that, but just for the CEIP. So what they're saying here is that in this presumptively approvable uh, text, EPA is proposing to include only some federal level definition, including uh, what you see listed here, a few geographic level definitions. So that would include the new markets tax credit or the HUD qualified census tracts, um, and then also some household level, level definitions, such as the Weatherization Assistance Program, or WAP, uh, income guidelines and the federal poverty level guidelines. So this is, and again, every, pretty much everything I'm saying today is what EPA is taking comment on in some way, shape, or form in this proposal. But in particular here, I wanted to emphasize that they're taking comment on whether um, these definitions or other definitions should be included in this presumptively approvable text for states to consider in their plans. So now moving on to um, demand-side energy efficiency projects within that low-income community reserve, getting into that in a little bit more detail. States have a great deal of flexibility to determine the types of eligible demand-side efficiency projects that they want to give credit to, just so long as they serve the people that fall within the state's definition of low-income community that we talked about on the previous slide. And so just so we can all get on the same page of demand-side efficiency, in this proposal, EPA defines it as referring to an extensive array of technologies, practices, and measures that are applied throughout all sectors of the economy to reduce electricity demand while providing the same and sometimes better level and quality of service. So really a broader array of, of technologies can, uh, and measures can fall within that definition. Um, as you can see listed here, these are a couple of examples that EPA uh, explicitly points to as um, types of projects that, that they recommend states. 
uh, uh, employ for this early action program, although these are not requirements. Again, the first bullet, I uh, want to keep that in mind, states have flexibility to, to, to consider what types of programs. But these are the ones that, that EPA is specifically calling out that would, would be um, you know, uh, some, some good program examples for states to consider. So looking first at the residential, this could apply to single and multifamily housing, group homes, shelters, temporary housing, and EPA notes that those last couple of examples listed there could fall under the term commercial for some utility billing purposes, um, but you know they would still, of course, be considered residential as, part, as far as the project is concerned. They also included a, a transmission and distribution T and D projects in this proposal as an example of something states could pursue, um, and they noted that the projects um, that that would be most most effective here would be ones that reduce consumption on the customer side of the meter. And particularly, they highlight conservation voltage reduction, or CVR, projects uh, in that section. And then um, also you can see listed here commercial is another big area that they, they list as uh, a recommended project type for states to consider. And here they're talking about buildings that provide critical services within or to low-income communities and or households, depending again on how states uh, use that definition. Uh, also, small businesses, organizations, and institutions that work with low-income residents. And um, you know, we think this can actually also be extended to combined heat and power, CHP. We don't know if EPA intended for CHP to be included as an eligible, eligible demand-side energy efficiency technology within this low-income community reserve. It's not listed as one of the acceptable examples in the proposal, but states do have a lot of flexibility, and we think that it should be included. And so uh, we are seeking clarity on this uh, area in our comments EPA, as we'll talk through in a couple of slides from now. And in the next few slides, we're going to discuss why we think it should be included and uh, also walk through a variety of benefits that CHP can provide to communities. And now I'm going to turn things over to Megan Kelly to talk about CHP. Thanks so much, Cassandra. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, the reason we care about CHP in the context of the CEIP is because it's a, it's a key energy efficient technology that can provide a variety of benefits to local communities. So that's what we'll get into here. Um, but, but before we go further, um, we'll explain what CHP is for, for those who may not already be familiar with it. Uh, combined heat and power is also known as cogeneration. It generates electricity and useful thermal energy in a single integrated system. Uh, heat uh, is a byproduct of generating electricity, and in a conventional uh, power generation situation, that heat is, is lost or wasted, but in a CHP system, uh, that heat is recovered and put to use. Uh, CHP is typically located at or near uh, the point where the electricity and heat are used, so it falls into the category of distributed generation, and it shares some of the low cost, high reliability, uh, fewer emissions kinds of benefits that, that other distributed generation technologies like renewables have. And there are a variety of different CHP technologies that use a variety of different kinds of fuels. Um, so this slide lists the typical benefits of CHP, which include um, a lot of system-wide benefits, but many of these also apply to communities. Uh, fuel efficiency and the ability to self-generate your own power with CHP uh, is what translates into lower energy costs, especially over the long term, and that can help building owners, uh, municipalities, uh, even tenants of buildings with CHP systems that can help them save money. CHP also brings significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, which improves the health and, and sustainability of communities. And uh, skipping down the list, the other really big benefit uh, that I see to communities is, is improved resiliency and reliability. Since CHP can operate independently of the larger grid, it is able to provide uninterrupted uh, service during, during major power outages and other emergencies. 
uh, which is a huge part of, of local resiliency planning. So all of these system-wide benefits occur, and many of them can improve uh, the quality of life at the community level. Uh, most people tend to think of CHP as an industrial technology. Um, I, in fact, work on ACEEE's industry team, which you heard earlier. Um, but, but there are many different applications of CHP. It will list them out on the next slide. Uh, so this, this list is from EPA's website, um, which shows different applications where CHP can be installed. And uh, it can be useful in, in commercial buildings. There are residential applications. Uh, institutional settings, like college uh, campuses and hospitals are good sites. Um, municipalities and government buildings are often also very good candidates. This last category, manufacturers, is, is where I think we often think that CHP falls. But, but the landscape is changing, and more and more uh, installations are happening outside of manufacturing in the, the commercial and institutional sector. Uh, the use of CHP in critical community infrastructure is really uh, one of the easiest ways to conceptualize, I think, the value um, that CHP can bring to communities. So that's what uh, we'll focus on first. Um, all communities have critical infrastructure facilities uh, that need to be able to provide uninterrupted electricity and heating or cooling services. And state and local governments prioritize and plan for how they can, can reinforce their critical facilities and make them as resilient as possible. Uh, and CHP is a key technology um, to achieve this. When hospitals, community centers, police and fire stations, schools, uh, other facilities that, that serve the community, when they're powered by CHP, they're better positioned to, to continue to provide services during uh, an outage. Uh, these facilities all have to have backup generators, but a CHP system is likely to be more reliable in an emergency um, because it's capable for, of islanding for uh, long periods of time. It can handle multi-day events. Um, it's more likely to be properly maintained and have a steady supply of fuel that can um, keep it uh, going for extended periods of time. So the benefits of, of having a CHP-powered critical facilities were really evident and clear during Hurricane Sandy um, when CHP kept the, the lights and heat going at, at many different facilities and allowed people to come together um, and find places of refuge. So we're going to give a couple of examples in the next slide. Uh, so this is an example of a CHP-powered hospital that continued operations during Sandy. DOE, the, D the Department of Energy, profiled this hospital in their 2013 report on um, CHP enabling resiliency for critical infrastructure, which is where um, this case study comes from. And also, there's about a dozen more, if, if folks want to um, find that. Uh, the, the South Oaks Hospital on Long Island has a, a campus with several buildings, including a psychiatric hospital, a nursing home, um, other, other buildings providing other important services. And they have uh, more than a megawatt of CHP capacity at their facility. They were able to isolate from the grid and, and continue operations during Sandy. And that enabled them to uh, continue to provide critical services to their patients. And importantly, it also enabled them to admit patients from other hospitals that didn't have power. So some hospitals had to evacuate their patients and, and transfer them. And uh, this hospital was one that was able to accept those uh, patients during the emergency. They also had um, you know, hot showers, and they let community members charge their phones. They were able to refrigerate food and operate their kitchen. Um, so uh, this place really was able to serve uh, as, a, as a place of refuge for the community. And I, I also think it's important to point out that even in a non-emergency situation, this facility can generate most of its own power, uh, which, which brings the benefit of um, lower operating and, and energy costs. And, and savings from that can free up funds that could go towards more direct services that benefit their patients. Uh, CHP can also bring similar benefits to the local community when it's installed in multifamily buildings. And this, um, this is interesting. It's been an area where the CHP market has been growing. Um, Green Tech Media released some, some research earlier this year. Uh, they found that multifamily residences 
had the greatest amount of CHP capacity growth among their non-industrial uh, among non-industrial customers. So there was a 46 percent increase uh, in the multifamily space over the last five years. Uh, in these kinds of, of residential applications, the heat from CHP is typically used for domestic hot water and space heating. Uh, it could also be used for dehumidifying um, and cooling. And the last thing to point out is that there's really significant potential for new CHP in the, in the multifamily space. Uh, DOE estimates that there's a uh, technical potential for CHP at more than 19,000 sites across the country. Um, which represents around 4,200 megawatts of, of new CHP capacity. So in the next slide, um, we're going to give an example um, of a mixed income multifamily building. This is on uh, Roosevelt Island in Manhattan. Uh, they pursued a series of energy efficiency projects, um, including CHP. And uh, it's a small, smaller 300 kilowatt CHP system. It provides about 15% of the building's electricity, and it heats about 40% of the hot water uh, needed in the apartment complex. I think there's about uh, 1,000 units. Uh, the CHP system is also equipped to function as an emergency generator. It powers all the critical building operations, including the ability to pump water to all apartments when there's an outage. Uh, the installation of CHP at this complex and the energy savings um, they benefit from will help maintain the affordability of this um, complex while reducing carbon dioxide emissions by over 1,600 tons of CO2 per year. And those emissions reductions result in health and environmental benefits to the community while, while also helping to meet uh, state carbon reduction goals. So this is my last slide, and, and it's a final example um, of how I think all of this could come together um, in a really cool way when we think about CHP-powered microgrids. Uh, this map shows a proposed community microgrid. It's a real proposal from the community of Red Hook in Brooklyn, um, which is particularly vulnerable. Uh, it was severely impacted by Hurricane Sandy. I remember reading that their outages were longer and, and lasted weeks. Um, the community is also home to the second largest New York City housing authority development. And one of the reasons that I think it's such a powerful example is because of the way that the proposal incorporates so many community buildings. The microgrid serves critical facilities, which are um, orange uh, on the map and, and also purple. There's public housing in green. The public schools are in yellow. Um, so I don't know exactly where this project stands today, but. Um, this community was a first round winner in the New York Prize Program, which is an initiative to promote microgrid deployment in New York. Um, that means they, they got funding to do a feasibility study, and CHP is uh, a generation technology that is evaluated in these feasibility studies because it serves as a great anchor for community microgrids um, like this one. So just to, to summarize, the key takeaway here is that uh, CHP systems can be a key technology for for serving communities. They can be an important resource in critical infrastructure and other public buildings. And uh, we think they could be a big opportunity for states to reduce uh, climate-related emissions while improving their resiliency. All right, great. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really helpful. We have a lot of questions coming through that we will get to at the end of the webinar, which should be pretty sh uh, shortly. But before we get to the end, I want to say uh, a few words about uh, ACCEE's working comments on this, this new CEIP proposal that we're um, uh, thinking through to submit to EPA, and also talk a bit about the uh, comments, submittal details, and the timing, and then provide you with some additional resources. So you can see here um, a few of the main things that we are thinking through and, and, and the major areas we're considering for comment. So we'll start with, with number one, um, expand the Clean Energy Incentive Program to include energy efficiency policies and measures eligible to receive one-to-one -one credit. Um, and we're talking about one-to-one -one credit within the Renewable Energy Reserve matching pool. And we think this would allow all energy efficiency to count under the CEIP, but would not affect uh, the matching credits or allowances available to energy efficiency projects that serve low-income communities 
within that other reserve, um, which we, we are proposing would still receive that, that two to one credit. Um, another comment that we are thinking through is to increase the two to one incentive for residential energy efficiency and solar projects implemented to serve low income communities. We believe the two to one match uh, may not be enough to overcome the barrier of upfront capital for residential low income projects. And we think that increasing the incentive uh, could help to ensure that residential projects are a major component of this early action program and that low income households can directly participate and benefit um, from, from this program. Uh, next, we have support flexibility for demand side energy efficiency projects serving low income communities. We talked a lot about the flexibilities that states have and the, the list of, of, of project examples that EPA provided in this new proposal. Um, this has to do with, with um, EPA recommending eligible projects versus being um, restrictive about what types of projects could qualify. And, and we're supportive of that state um, flexibility. Uh, and we also talked about um, including um, com uh, combined heat and power, uh, and then um, be, being supportive of EPA's recommendations of residential, uh, commercial, and, and CPR energy efficiency projects. And then lastly, we have um, to support the uh, creation of that op optional, presumptively approvable regulatory text that we talked a bit about when we went through the definition of low-income communities and how EPA was proposing certain things uh, to be included in that uh, optional, uh, presumptively approvable text. And so we're, you know, in support of the creation of that and, um, you know, have some recommendations of, of how to be a little bit more specific and, and how to include a little, some more things in there. So that's kind of generally what we're thinking, and we're really we're hoping for for feedback. And um, if if there's interest in in these comments or these topics, it would be great to continue the discussion with with you all on the line, whoever's interested about comments over the coming weeks. And and please feel free to reach out to us directly to talk through um, any of these areas, or if you have different ideas. And we'll have our contact information up at the end here. Now, how do, how do you comment? How does anyone comment on this proposal? Uh, well, I mentioned that it was this proposal was published in the Federal Register, I think I said June 20th before. What I really meant was June 30th. Um, and that kicked off uh, 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 the clock on, on um, the deadline to submit comments. Um, the deadline is September 2nd uh, for people to submit comments to EPA. And they can do so in a number of ways. You can find the details of how to submit, go about submitting comments in the link here to the Federal Register. Also something to point out, I'm sure um, a lot, most of you on the line are, are aware or even planning to attend, but EPA is holding a public hearing in Chicago on August 3rd, so next week. And the idea for that is to get some uh, uh, people to, to submit kind of spoken comments uh, to, to EPA. Uh, which I'm sure you can do so in addition to written comments as well. So here are some additional resources. We have a ton of resources, of course, being ACEEE. Uh, we have no shortage of, of resources uh, for people to look through. First though on this list, I really want to point out, this is EPA's Clean Energy Incentive Program kind of homepage. Uh, so definitely take a look at that for um, information cited all throughout uh, the majority of this presentation. Um, it includes a link to the, the Federal Register. You can find the technical supporting documents there, along with some helpful fact sheets uh, and other information, including uh, webinar slides from EPA as well on the Clean Energy Incentive Program. Also want to point out um, uh, ACCEE's Clean Power Plan resource um, webpage and our a couple of other resources listed here. A lot of them are focused on um, energy efficiency projects serving low-income communities, so you can get an idea of some best practices um, for utility programs and other things to focus on. And then here's a whole slide dedicated to resources on uh, uh, combined heat and power that we heard from, from Megan, and a whole slew of resources, including several from EPA, 
uh, DOE, uh, and HUD as well. So now we'll get to um, some questions. And uh, we have a lot of questions coming through the line, so please uh, keep, keep them coming and we'll try to get to as many as possible. But I also want to emphasize that we have our contact information listed here, so please feel free to reach out directly, particularly if you don't get your question heard uh, right now. Um, but also if you want to have kind of a more in-depth conversation about anything we talked about today, certainly feel free to reach out. Um, we'll go through the line here. So we have a, a question about whether um, other types of technologies such as biomass and wastewater digesters um, are, are are considered renewable energy under the CEIP. The four technologies I listed at the beginning were the four that EPA listed in this proposal. Um, so those four include wind, solar, geothermal, and hydropower. And um, you can uh, get a sense as to why EPA included those types of technologies, particularly the new additions of the geothermal and the hydro. Um, uh, it's kind of described throughout the proposal, and they and they based it on a set of four criteria in particular that uh, the technologies needed to meet um, certain criteria in order to be considered uh, eligible for this program. So I um, urge you to, to look through that, but those four are the ones that EPA has listed. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, we have another question coming through about um, CHP, so this will be for Megan. Can the community-based benefits of CHP work outside of places like New York City? Um, that's where a lot of the examples you gave were from, particularly for the reliability benefits. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important question. We often think about how what works in one state doesn't work in another. Um, and a lot of the examples that we have to demonstrate uh, the resiliency benefits of CHP are in New York, uh, where the impacts of, of Sandy really motivated action um, to promote resiliency and improve infrastructure at the state and local levels. I think the economics for CHP are, are also favorable in New York, and there are some really advanced um, state policies that provide incentives and, and grants for CHP on its own, and also to promote resiliency. I, I mentioned the, the New York Prize earlier, for example, on microgrids. Um, we do see examples in other places. Um, in the Northeast, including Connecticut and Massachusetts and New Jersey. These are all also communities that were, were impacted by Sandy. Um, we also see examples of CHP as a, as a community resilient strategy in um, regions like the Gulf Coast, uh, for, for example, um, where again, resiliency is a big driver, um, but, but we also get all these other benefits of emissions reductions and, and cost savings. So I think uh, one interesting thing to point out, um, speaking of, of Gulf Coast, is that um, both Texas and Louisiana have uh, have policies, state level legislation on the books that, that require the consideration of CHP in public buildings and, and critical infrastructure. Um, so whenever they're going to be doing significant renovations or planning new construction in, in public buildings, uh, they should look to CHP. Um, before they uh, choose something different or, or to find out whether or not it, the, the benefits would be there. So it's happening elsewhere. It's not just an urban thing, but with resiliency as a, as a primary driver, I think we'll continue to tend to see a lot of examples um, in places that are particularly vulnerable, like New York. Okay, great. Thank you. We have a, a couple of questions that I'll kind of put, put together, hopefully answer um, all, of, all of them somewhat. So we have a, a question about um, the demand side energy efficiency, the eligible projects under that low income community reserve and whether um, utility uh, programs under you know, state mandated utility run programs would be eligible, um, particularly those that are uh, implemented for low income customers. And um, that's certainly a great example and where a lot of states uh, actually put forth a lot of investment in low-income uh, programs serving uh, low-income demand side energy efficiency programs right now and EPA actually in the in the proposal 
uh, particularly highlights utility programs, because so that would um, seem to be something that would certainly be eligible under that low income community reserve. Um, also, question about what the value of uh, an ERC or an allowance will be under the CEIP. Great question. Um, wish I had an answer for that. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that anyone uh, at this point uh, would have an answer for that because it's just dependent on the market. Um, so we'll have to kind of wait and see. But but uh, past programs such as Reggie are a great example to look to to kind of get an idea of what it could be um, by averaging out a couple of years. Um, and so that's something that we can use in, as an example right now. But if, uh, it's hard to, to judge that without getting the market going. Um, also for we have a question about what are the uh, uh, EM&V evaluation, measurement, and verification requirements uh, for demand side energy efficiency projects under the low income community reserve. So how would uh, project implementers be able to, 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 to get the allowances or ERCs uh, by claiming savings? So those EM&V requirements are for um, are the, the same requirements that EPA put forth in their EM&V guidelines under the Clean Power Plan final rule. And the, um, those guidelines were for rate-based plans. And EPA says that the EM&V requirements for rate-based plans under the CEIP are the same EM&V requirements for math-based plans for set-asides under the CEIP. There was actually a, a, a paragraph in the in this proposal that talked a bit about uh, EM and V and, and, and striking a, a, the, the paragraph within the final emission guidelines that um, makes that, that requirement that rate-based and math-based plants have the same EM and V for CEIP set-asides, uh, but in all actuality that was just administrative uh, uh, removal. So um, we, we, we got some clarification from EPA that the EM&V requirements are indeed the same for the rate-based and math-based plans under the, the CEIP. And again, those follow those uh, EM&V guidelines from EPA. Um, let's see here. We have a, another question. We'll do another one on CHP. Um, uh, okay. So, um, there are good, so this one's for me again. There are good CHP projects and, and not so good CHP projects. Uh, so uh, how would you clearly bound the project definition so as to not um, uh, waste the additional credit offered? Um, so we're talking now about uh, including CHP under that low income community reserve eligible project. Also, CHP projects can be um, significantly expensive. Um, so we can talk a bit about how to, um, some options available for financing. Okay, so how can you limit projects to make sure it's a good one? I agree there are certainly some good ones and some um, bad ones. Uh, there was also another question that, that we saw come through about what sizes the HP system should be restricted to. Um, so I think maybe just combining those two questions um, I haven't yet thought about, about size limits, but I would certainly expect for there to be um, uh, a minimum efficiency requirement so that systems are achieving the, the heat rates and, and the high efficiency that really results in, in, in fuel savings and, and emissions reductions. I think we can look to um, uh, some of the really good utility programs um, that have put kind of clear boundaries on, on what systems are eligible for incentives. Um, uh, I think we should look to those programs for, for ideas about where to set those. I think another consideration is the fact that that CHP, um, it, has, it has fewer emissions than conventional generation, but it's, but it's not uh, zero emitting. EPA categorizes it as, as low emitting generation. And they've developed a formula in the Clean Power Plan for how to fairly account for the environmental benefits of CHP. Um, and 
so I think it shouldn't be too much of an administrative burden or, or a hassle to, to kind of do, do the same thing in, in the CIP to, to really ensure the, the environmental integrity and, and the energy efficiency benefits um, for communities. Um, the, the cost question is really interesting. So I think upfront capital costs could be um, a really big hurdle for, for some multifamily buildings, especially if we're talking about public housing, which um, would already be uh, really strapped for, for cash. Um, so I guess I, I agree. This is an important consideration when we think about um, capital that communities have. And one of the reasons that I thought that Roosevelt Landings was um, such a good case study and, and project, and I didn't go into this earlier, but that project got um, special financing from the, the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation. Um, I don't know that much about this project, but there's an excellent case study um, that, that was put out. Um, so if people want to learn more details about this, um, it's available. Um, but, but this uh, EEC is a nonprofit finance company that provides loans um, for efficiency and other clean energy projects. So there was third party financing. Um, they also were able to take advantage of over a million dollars in state and utility rebates um, and, and grants that helped to bring down the cost for that project. Uh, the value of um, uh, credits through the Clean Power Plan would, would be added on to that. Um, but, but I do think that there are um, opportunities for, for financing um, in, the, in the community space. Uh, that could help address um, costs. Great, thank you very much. That was a um, very informative discussion on those questions. Um, we have a question about clarifying the timing um, in which states or utilities can begin getting credit for low-income community um, programs or projects. Um, do they have to be installed um, at a certain date? And so I'll just, um, again, you know, clarify the the information that EPA put forward in this proposal um, does change. It, it changed from the prior uh, draft proposal on the CEIP, and now they have these new uh, definitions for um, renewable energy projects. It's commenced commercial operation, um, which is when the project begins selling usable electricity, and you can. Um, dig into the, the proposal a little bit further to get more detail on that. But that date is on or after January 1, 2020. And then for demand side energy efficiency projects serving low income communities, it's um, when the project is delivering quantifiable and verifiable electricity savings. Um, and that date is on or after September 6, 2018. Uh, we have another CHP question from uh, Megan. Um, I, I thought I heard you say that uh, captured heat from CHP could be used for space cooling. Um, did I hear that correctly? And if so, how does that work? Um, so super quick answer. <laughs> um, heat from CHP can be used um, uh, for cooling. It can be used to produce uh, chilled water for air conditioning or refrigeration. Uh, the technology is called an absorption chiller. Um, I'm, I'm no engineer, so I um, should stop there, but I can put you in touch with more information, um, and, and I'll, I'll leave it to, to the engineers to tell you more about how it works. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. So, uh, Trying to read through some additional incoming questions here. Um, so uh, we have a question about: Do you know what states are? If, whether certain states are considering CEIP um, projects to fall under CEIP credit at this time. Um, we have been working in a variety of states and different regions throughout the country, and we've heard a lot of interest for participating in the CEI program, CEIP program. However, um, from what we've heard, states are not necessarily committing certain types of projects at this time just because it's been so um, up in the air as to what the final program guidelines are and therefore what 
types of projects would fit within those guidelines. Um, this, this new proposal gives a lot of clarity on that. However, it is still a proposal at this point. So I think that um, it will be really helpful for states to get um, some, some final guidance on the CEIP to really dig down and figure out what types of uh, projects um, will fall under whatever type of low-income community definition uh, they choose to move forward with for the program. Um, we have another uh, question coming through on um, for CHP. Um, I thought the CEIP was restricted to zero emitting resources. Wouldn't that exclude CHP as an eligible technology? And this, this is getting at I mentioned the, the four criteria um, by which EPA uh, was basing um, uh, eligible technologies off of. So this is kind of getting to that question. So Megan, you can take that away. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and, and you can clarify and add more. I think um, it's clear in the renewable energy reserve uh, that that is restricted to zero emitting resources. There are the four criteria that projects have to meet. But it's not crystal clear from the proposal what's eligible um, as the demand side efficiency for the low-income community reserve. So um, I think it will be helpful to get clarification um, from the agency about what they intended regarding CHP in the LICR. And um, we think uh, that much like the examples that EPA provided for eligible efficiency in commercial buildings, that, that CHP serves communities uh, in a similar way and could be a, could be a good opportunity for states. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and we have another question asking about whether the, the, the credits or allowances available within the CEIP will be sufficient for any state to reach their goal. And um, the way at least the allowances are apportioned at the moment um, for most states, they'll still have a, a bit of a way to go, um, even if they do use up all of the allowable matching allowances or ERPs available to them through the through that EPA's matching pool. Um, and you can get a better sense for an individual state that you're thinking about uh, by looking at that fact sheet that EPA provided. I, I, I went through a few slides ago that showed the state and then uh, the amount of allowances uh, under each of those reserves that EPA is proposing to apportion to states. Uh, and if you're, you're curious, you can then kind of sync that up with the state's goal and how many uh, tons of CO2 that they need to reduce and get uh, kind of a percentage that way. But um, also talk, uh, there's another question about <coughs> whether the addition of uh, solar projects uh, within the low-income community reserve, so again, uh, in the prior CEIP um, guidelines, the prior proposal, um, EPA was just um, uh, suggesting that low-income energy efficiency projects receive the two-to-one credit. And in this new proposal that was released in June, EPA was saying that um, solar projects implemented to serve low-income communities should also be eligible for that two-to-one credit. And so the question is, will that um, take away at all from the demand side efficiency projects and at least from looking at EPA's potential numbers that they provided in their technical support document and also um, uh, detailed within this new proposal, it looks like um, neither uh, the demand side efficiency nor the solar will um, uh, is, is projected to uh, eat through all of those available 150 million uh, allowances for um, the low-income community reserve and um, so you know that's another consideration if, if they're not used up at this point EPA is proposing to retire all of them so it's just another consideration for, for people to, to think through um, you know the goals of the program and, and how best to utilize those available allowances and credits. Um, I know there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to, but um, we are going to have to wrap it up now at, at the top of the hour here. And again, um, especially for all of those that we, whose questions we didn't address, please feel free to um, reach out to us directly with our contact information listed here. 
and we really appreciate all of your comments and feedback, and uh, we look forward to, to continuing the discussion. And thanks again.